if you want uh, whenever you are basing here where, where you are sitting so uh, i'm um, uh, i'm gum a senior program manager of the education program at the British Council in Vietnam. I base in Hanoi. So, firstly, I would like to um, uh, address to Professor Huan Nguyen, chair of uh, VIS, um, all of our um, uh, uh, speakers and uh, all of the participants. You are the earlier career researchers. So, firstly, many, many thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today at the second workshop on writing grant applications that organized by VIS and supported by the British Council. Um, first, uh, and uh, now I'd like to say a little bit, um, a little about the British Council. Maybe some of you know who we are and also some of you maybe still new, uh, we, we are still new to you. So here in Vietnam, we have a dynamic uh, portfolio spanning our three core sectors of the counter education, including higher and non-formal education and English language, including, including teaching, learning and assessment. Through our different programs, we support Vietnam's human capital development across sectors, building lasting partnerships and connections between both countries and contributing to Vietnam, Vietnam's ambitions for sustainable social economics growth and development. Position British Council, VIS, UK Vietnam Higher Education Network as enabler for facilitator for UK Vietnam partnership in research development PhD training and joint research for Vietnamese early career researcher. So in this context, the partnership between the British Council, VIS and UK Vietnam Higher Education Network have been signed on the 3rd of July, 2023 and is valid until 31st of March, 2025 um, with the main aims to help the earlier career researchers who have been working with British Council in a previous program to improve earlier career research, research scientific writing, grant application skill, as well as provide guidance for their career development through carefully designed mentoring program and group activities. The second uh, aim is uh, to support the potential PhD candidates from Project 89, especially the ones who plan to enroll in a PhD program in the UK and Ireland, including helping their, their admission application and finding suitable university and PhD supervisors. I believe that this workshop will provide you um, both mentee and researcher in Vietnam with a step-by-step -step guide and expert advice on grant and funding applications. It is a great opportunity that we have a group of BIS, academic and extensive and variety um, and, and, and variety experience obtaining grants from UKRI Research Council and international funding bodies to be speaker for today's event. They can help you to address the issue of lacking writing, publication, bidding, skill, and of course, related, it's all related to the grant application. And the training opportunity and the practice activity that have taken place over the first and the second workshop have been very valuable in supporting capacity building for Vietnamese earlier career researchers. So huge thanks to everyone for coming today together in creating an enabling environment for quality in research sector in Vietnam, and we are happy to contribute and support where possible. Many thanks to you colleagues and friends from VIS for your resilience throughout the partnership implementation. Thank you and have a fruitful workshop. Over to you, Viet. Thank you very much. Um... Uh, Chigom, uh, thank you for your support from BC. Uh, without the support, we wouldn't be able to organize such meaningful and uh, helpful events for the earlier early career researchers in Vietnam. So once again, thank you, and we look forward to having further collaboration and, and support from BC in the future. Now, I would thank like you. to um, invite, um, because Professor Huan Nguyen, our chair, uh, he is uh, not available today, unfortunately, but we do have uh, other uh, VCs, other vice chairs from VIS, and in particular, I would like to invite um, Dr. Dr. Gui Anh, who is our vice chair, uh, the professor at uh, Coventry. Uh, she would um, be able to say a few words on behalf of this. Gui Anh, please. Thank you, uh, Viet Anh and everyone. 
I would like to welcome you all, and I would like to thank the British Council again. And uh, I'm delighted to say that this event is organized uh, with uh, Menti in mind, but we do have a lot of um, VIS members. This is actually a forum for us to learn and to share um, from each other, uh, to share experience with each other. So I do hope that we uh, will learn um, from um, junior as well as senior um, academic uh, in the UK, and we do want to learn also the requirement requirement from uh, the funder outside the UK, uh, particularly in Vietnam. And um, we also have colleague here who are going to give you a brief overview of our program for um, the project so far. So I may um, may I invite uh, Dr. Sun Huang from Southampton University who um, has kindly um, prepared a progress report for, um, for all of us to know where we are in this mentoring program. Sun, please, over to you. Yep, thank you very much, uh, Um, I mean, Let me share my screen. All right. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, it's good. All right. Um, let me move this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will, on behalf of VIS, uh, in particular, uh, together with uh, Wang and uh, Enwan, um, I prepared this particular uh, short update for the program. Um, just to a reminder about the aim of this program to support you know, up to 100 Vietnamese researchers uh, to enhance their research capability and career progression, as you know, Gum said earlier. Um, and we organized you know, uh, several activity, and this particular workshop, for example, is one a part of this uh, activity as well. Uh, besides that, you know, we also organized the mentoring uh, session, either in a group or uh, individual, uh, between uh, October um, 2023, when the program uh, officially start and uh, until May uh, 2024. Uh, in the future, we also uh, one would like to organize one week visit uh, to the UK uh, for up to 1590 uh, and will take place you know, sometime um, before March 2025. So that's the aim you know, for this particular program. And as a target for this particular program, we have met your early researcher career uh, from uh, Business Council Researcher Connect program uh, and also PhD candidate of the uh, Project 89 uh, and other Vietnamese uh, researcher, and among this particular target, you know, we uh, prioritize the female researcher uh, a, a, as well. So some of these um, <clears throat> programs up to date here. Uh, so we opened the registration for this particular program for Menti uh, in August 2023, uh, and uh, up to uh, and we have uh, when it closed in October 2023, we have 78 Menti register. Uh, and among them, 50 uh, females. So that one of the target that we actually uh, aim at. And after that, you know, uh, we match uh, 30 mentors uh, with 56 mentees. As you can see, that you know, there's some mentees that are actually not assigned, um, and I will talk about that later as well. Uh, so the undersigned mentee was assigned to some mentor from uh, the the VIS executive board uh, who managed that. Uh, after that, we uh, organized the workshop, uh, the first workshop in publishing research output on the um, October um, 2023. Um, and today is the second workshop on writing a grant application as well. Uh, early feedback, you know, indicate that some collaboration already established between the mentor and mentee in co-author uh, on research application um, and also uh, research grant uh, application as well. Um, so in terms of registration, as I mentioned before, this is you know, uh, you know, the um, graphic for the gender balance you know, of that. And as you can see, about two thirds of the um, mentees are, are female. Um, and in terms of the research group in here, uh, we, as I mentioned before, that we have your three different uh, group. Um, and so you know, um, we actually have about two thirds of the, uh, again, of the mentees are from the early career, career researcher uh, from the Researcher Connex program, uh, and one third is other. Uh, surprisingly, we don't have any uh, PhD candidate from the Project 89, and this is something that you know, we would like to improve as well. Um, at least here, the kind of new research area, uh, according to CAH, which is a common aggregation hierarchy, which basically categorizes 
different uh, basically discipline um and some of the you know um number a great number of researchers actually coming from areas such as you know business management um language and area study uh, and social science and things like that and you can see that you know it actually quite a great diversity but also some area actually have you know, a lot of many uh, registers. Uh, I quickly, before I finish, I quickly mention some of the challenges that you know uh, that we have. Uh, if, you know, we actually have you know achieved you know a lot of things, organized workshops and things like that. But there's also the challenge that you know we sh you know recognize from this from this particular program. Um, the first thing I want to say is that you know, the the delay in the mental matching, um, and it due to you know the the unbalance, you know, imbalance in terms of the uh, the the area, as I mentioned before, uh, in terms, you know, for example, in business management, but also because of lacking mentor in some area, uh, such as you know linguistic uh, and 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 area study, um, and we already reach out to outside of VIS and invite you know additional uh, ment mentor as well, uh, but the overall process of mentor matching just need to be uh, still need uh, improvement. Uh, also, you know, in terms of communication. Uh, as well as the the challenge in terms of you know, the time difference between Vietnam and UK, uh, and also it make you know the communication between mentor and mentee uh, quite challenging as well. Uh, some of the email exchange take quite long, which causes you know delay in terms of the in in, in terms of the matching um, yeah, a, a, as well. Um, and some you know, we introduce a dedicated you know executive secretary for the uh, for the program, and hopefully that will improve the um, um, the the communication. Um, Another challenge that we see is that you know, there's diversity, great diversity in both your know, research area, but also in terms of the career stage. And it is really challenging for you know to find a common team and interest when organizing event, um, you know, uh, additional event uh, for the program. Uh, and as I mentioned before, there's a lack of mentee from the Project 89. And we believe that you know, it is a missing opportunity, given that we actually have you know, a lot of experience with the PhD um, uh, process here in the UK. Uh, so as such, you know, we would like to, you know, um, um, find additional channel in order to uh, to get more uh, PhD candidate from this uh, project eighty nine. Right. Uh, that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Bernard. Thank you very much, Angstern, for your thorough report um, and updates on the progress of the mentorship program. I believe this is a great initiative, um, although we are facing challenges, but I hope that um, with the support from British Council and also the great efforts from the team, uh, including also uh, mentees and mentors, we'll be able to overcome these challenges. And I think the event today, for example, the workshop we're organizing today will, will um, go to some great lengths to addressing the uh, issues um, within our program. Yeah. But let me now turn to um, the main component, the first main component of our workshop, which is three presentations by our three speakers. And as you can see, um, the, the aim of, of these presentations is to provide a um, specific step-by-step um, -step guidance on the process of applying for grant applications. So we have three speakers and each talk will last for around 15 minutes. And at the end of the session, we'll have a 50 minute Q&A for questions and answers. And I would like to, uh, first of all, welcome um, my, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Ling Nguyen. Um, she's a lecturer at the University of uh, Lon College London, and she's an expert uh, in the field of uh, biomaterials, um, having a lot of successes in terms of um, getting grants, even as a early career researcher herself. So um, all to you, all over to you, Ling. Can you uh, start sharing the screen? Yes. Can you see Great, my screen? You. Yes, I can. Thanks. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, for inviting me to talk today. And I'm very happy to give any experience um, for UK funding application and uh, at a, a new PI. So um, I will cover uh, the topic about a funding application journey for a new PI. So first of all, uh, please allow me to uh, have quickly introduce about myself. So I'm a chemist. I got my bachelor degree in chemistry from University of uh, Science in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. And uh, I got a master degree in chemical engineering in South Korea and um, PhD in biomedical engineering. And uh, from here, 
uh, something in the chat. Okay. So uh, from here, I started to do research in biomaterial and uh, tissue engineering, regenerative medicine. After the PhD, I work at a postdoc for three years in Korea. And um, I went to uh, University of Oxford in the UK for the second postdoc. And uh, my research uh, was expanded uh, to work on the stem cell uh, therapies, expansion and harvesting. And um, I become a PI from uh, May uh, 2019 at a lecturer from University College London at Eastman Dental Institute. And the reason why I show of my um, research uh, background here to looking for also collaboration. If uh, you feel like interesting this field, we can work together, UK and Vietnam. So please feel free to contact me and we can figure out uh, any funding scheme that we can work together. So when we talk about a PI, so what is a PI? So something is very, uh, very general. PI is the person who have idea, you can manage the group, maybe a group of a student or a postdoc who is awarded the fund and also someone that uh, you is, can decide the content or direction of uh, their research. So they can be a PI. And in this case, uh, today we will focus more a PI that is awarded the fund. So um, did you know that it's only 10 to 20% of grant application are successful in uh, from the UK Research Council and uh, that uh, make, um, making the process increasingly competitive for uh, the researcher is very, very competition. So um, first of all, we have to understand the landscape. So this is the fundamental funding model. So you as a full-time academic and the funder, they are buying a bit of your time to do research and your institute or your university will contribute some of level of support. So in the UK, usually it's about 20% and it already has facilities and resources and provide other support. And it's, this is mostly for uh, the fun fundamental funding model. So for the funder, uh, funding level, um, actually there are a lot of uh, variation of grant, but in here, I just want to show some of uh, some common grants. So it can be a small grant for travel, for buy some small equipment and some internal grant fellowships and some grant for new PI grant for, uh, for me, for also some grant for established PI or for program uh, grant for some senior academic. And the funder in the UK and mostly um, from UK Research Council, or also we can apply from the European uh, funding and from charity, from uh, private donor and foundation, or sometimes it can from crowd searching. And uh, what the funder uh, look for. So before you go for any um, application, first you have to check about the eligibility. So who the scheme is for, because sometimes it's for new PI, but some is they for like a very experienced uh, senior academic. So you have to check first if you can apply for that fund or not. And also you have to check if uh, it's fixed with their objective and change their direction. For example, some funder, they just give some funding for this fund uh, for, for a limit of field. So you have to check if your research field is fixed in uh, their uh, their objective. And also like some fun, uh, some scheme, they have a set time. So you have to think about like, for example, your proposal, it can be completed within the set time, two year, three year, or you need longer, five year, for example. So you have to check about that first. And of course, uh, your um, your idea, your proposal is has a meaningful impact on people or society. So you have to look for the problem first. What is the problem? Uh, and what is your expertise that you can use the expertise to solve the problem? So you have to think about it, looking for the problem and your expertise can solve the problem. Then you can start uh, writing or provide some solution. And also the research will be of high, higher standard, so which is can lead in the field. So, uh, and after you understand the landscape and um, you have to prepare for your journey, 
And first of all, you have to build uh, your CV to be strong. You have a strong track record. And one of the, the tips for me uh, to build your strong CV is try to uh, participate as a chair in international net or national conference, invite a speaker, or if not, then you can contribute to organize or even though just for technical committee or involve is a, a panel a member. Because just think about uh, you submitted a proposal and uh, one of the comment from a reviewer is could be oh I seen the person speak at the conference so you know people know you so from that experience so I think is that really really important so try to get the people to know you so they will feel like okay in that environment academic environment so it will be it's really important and also you need to plan in advance so for me it's at least 12 months because there are so many things you have to prepare from the, the day you have the idea and then you have to plan ahead. For example, you try to familiar yourself with the fun finder, fun finding a shirt uh, uh, system. For example, there are some software or some app or some um, engine that you can find uh, do, do to find the fun finding shirt. And also uh, you need to sign up for any funding call notification because when you sign up, you go to the funding scheme and you sign up and any any new open call, they will send email to you. So you have the, the update, like what kind of funding, the notification that is, and then you can find out which one is suitable for you. And also for me, also I try to learn to build uh, for the skill set. For example, when you write a, um, a proposal or grant, then you have to do the costing. So you need to learn like the finance and project management. For example, you have two years in two years. How can you finish in two years? How can you use the money for, for example, for consumable, for pay, the people work for you for travel. So you need to slowly learn about that. And if you have collaborator, you need to talk to them first and you say, okay, look, I have the idea and why I want to submit for a grant. Can we work together? So you need to talk to them in advance, it's not like it's very near to the day you submit and then sometimes the collaborator, they, they say, okay, we don't think we can work together. So we need to talk to them, talk to the department. Uh, the department, I will come back in the next few slides, uh, why we need to talk to our department. And also you need to talk to the people who is already successful, secure the funding. So to learn the experience in the field, if you don't know, you can ask your department or university, maybe they know, who already successful uh, received the funding. And then uh, you can start writing. So in terms of department, uh, you need to talk to them. And there are some questions you can, you should to make sure like, for example, if, uh, okay, talk to them, uh, I, I'm going to apply this funding. And if I get uh, the grant, so do we have space for that, for me to work? Do we have uh, any vacancy or uh, do we, uh, is, is it fit to uh, what we do? And also sometimes you can ask the department to get some budgets, uh, small budgets to help you uh, from the beginning. So you can should ask anything about that. And also any available facility is across the institute. For example, you from this department, but you want to work uh, with uh, 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 equipment from another department. So you need to talk to them. If you want to do like that, the department will support you or not. And also it's very important about admin support because uh, we are academic and then we have like multi uh, tasking. So we know how to write things, run and costing, but some, somehow we need to do the admin support. We don't know. So we really need from the department that give, give us like 1% or 2%, like one hour, two hour uh, from admin to support us. And about you, so when you talk, uh, so you try to talk to the senior staff in your department and to know, like to get to know because they, they have experience on or apply, apply, apply grant. So talk to them and also uh, be aware of where your department will go. For example, some department in the future, they want to ride to that uh, research direction. So you need to know about the direction of the department. And then because when you submit a proposal, they will say, okay, uh, this department, what will you do? Well, the in this department, you, you want to they want to see like you contribute and then make your yourself is useful. And then when you're writing uh the robot show, uh it's it's very different from scheme to scheme. For example, for me, I I um I 
I'm trying to apply for at a new PI grant. So uh, among, I mean, uh, we of course we need to give innovative idea, so many things, uh, but there's a, some section is very important is outline your career plan Be, uh, over for example, the next five years or 10 years, because when you apply for a new PI, they want to see how, uh, how will you develop? How will you use the grant? to make you become uh, an expert in the field. So you have to be very clear about uh, the career plan and uh, including some potential funding like you want to, to, to apply after this grant, you have to be very clear. And also like the environment um, uh, uh, environment support, for example, the lab facility, any technical support that's available for you. So you have to be very clear. And uh, when writing, I will break down uh, the component of the grant proposal. So I try to explain each part and what the reviewer looking for. So I will break down part by part. And then after that, we can combine together. And it's very important is get someone to read your proposal. For example, you can ask all the PI in the institute, someone you trust, and be aware of the IP protection as well. So someone really you trust and someone is building the institute. So that's one we can have the IP protection. And when you're writing, you repair, and then you submit the application. And uh, before that, uh, you have to make sure like uh, which way, for example, sometimes some scheme, they have uh, electronic submission platform, but not just only one. For example, it's go to the portal and also you need to submit something else uh, from, from the electric electronic submission platform. So you have to make sure like you cover everything. It's not like end of the day, you say, oh, I already submit, uh, submitted. But then there are something else. So you have to make sure like how many platform of the electronic or, or um, paper submission you have to make sure. And of course you have to uh, review uh, before that, you have to review your proposal carefully and to emphasize review and editing if you need that and you have to review and check carefully. And uh, also you need to discuss uh, some like supported document required in advance. And because sometimes they will need some other, for example, some uh, initially data or some other support information. So some scheme they require like that. So you have to prepare. And one thing is very important is the letter of support from the head of department. You have to prepare in advance because um, when you give a letter of support to your head department to, to sign, then sometimes they are on holiday, sometimes they are busy. So it takes like one or two weeks for them to return to you. So you have to give them like three or four weeks before the deadline of the submission. Otherwise, you don't have enough the documents. So you have to plan and writing the letter of support and send to them. And after the submission, then wait and be repaired. If, uh, luckily, if you were chosen to go to the interview, then you have to prepare for the interview. So normally it takes like two weeks from the day, they give you two weeks for the interview. And also uh, they have to be looking for advice, how to respond the feedback is constructively. Mm -hmm. And yeah. also um, you, if possible, you need to practice. Mm -hmm. You need to practice the, the interview uh, in front of your group, in front of like senior uh, PI in your institute. But some case, if you fail, then you need to ask for the feedback because sometimes well, I, submit, I submitted several grants and sometimes I didn't receive any feedback because they say like a lot of application, they, they, they weren't able to give me any feedback, but then ask them. So I try to send email and ask them like, look, I want to improve my proposal. So don't worry, just send an email and ask them and I'm sure they will send you, give you some feedback. So uh, just give some example about myself. So uh, when I joined uh, UCL, I submitted at a new uh, PI scheme. So uh, there, there are so many things I try, but I just want to give some uh, two example. The first one is actually this one in Vietnam, you can try to submit that. It's from Johnson & Johnson and it support only five women on the world, on over the world. So they will give some money for five women in, in STEMs. Uh, so in Vietnam, you can try for that. And also I try with the uh, springboard uh, from uh, AMS uh, to submit. Unfortunately, it's unsuccessful. Then also like I, I, I try to, okay. So they also don't give me any feedback. And I try to ask them, 
And after like few email and they, they provide me the feedback and they mentioned that, okay, your proposal is very positive on the scientific, uh, it's very innovation, uh, innovative outcome. However, because this is like I mentioned before, because this is for uh, at a new PI. So I have to uh, make sure is um, give more detail on the career plan in detail and also the environment and support give more information and because they didn't mention to put a timeline, so I didn't put a timeline, but they say that if you have a timeline, it would be helpful. So it's very helpful to put in your uh, robot show, even though they didn't ask for. And also the letter of support also need to be put in very detail because they want to see what your department can support you because you are new. And so uh, this is very important. You are new, so what is the you can re receive from your department? So that's one. I didn't mention, I didn't know that and then I write very, very in general. So this is the feedback that I learned from this uh, two funding. And also I try to apply uh, at the COI because this also unsuccessful, unfortunately. And uh, uh, so uh, I showed the, the, the um, I showed the, the funding in here because actually we can work together. So at UCL, there's a funding global engagement fund. So I tried to apply to travel to Vietnam and also there are research environment link from Newton Fund and I, I submitted with a university in Turkey, but we can try with the Vietnamese side. And also within UCL, we have a, a internal small grant is for global challenge research a fund. To, to do to work something is uh, some challenge, the global challenge, something is a big problem in Vietnam and we can work together. And I also apply together with University of Vietnam and also some other fund also I try with, uh, with this fund, uh, university. However, it, even though it's unsuccessful, but after that we development a research collaboration because we work together uh, during writing the grant. So just try. And then right now also I have some student Ichan with the with different university, uh, not in the UK, and also uh, we are now co-supervising student. And after like two year uh, fail, and I am I'm thinking, so okay, we have to slow down. We have to receive the feedback to improve uh, our proposal. So this is I I got I I get uh, awarded at the COI. So the COI is is uh, it can be that like you work with uh, some senior collaborator. So uh, it's not just uh, you focus uh, to submit the funding as an, a PI, you have to uh, looking for collaborator, uh, collaboration. And um, the, 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 and, uh, the best choice is to go to looking for collaborator within your institute. And it's not just you go and knock the door and say, okay, uh, can I work with you? It's not like that. You have to be repaired. Like for example, you have to offer them what do you have and you have to understand what do they have and what we can work together. So you need to talk to them. You need to convince them, okay, I have this, you have that. I think we can work together. And if you know any um, funding scheme that uh, fit to uh, you and uh, your collaborator and tell them, okay, this is uh, an open call, it's open. And if, for example, in the next few months, it, they will, the deadline next few months, so can we apply for this? So go talk to them, offer your expertise, understand, there a few and also do some action. So it will keep going. So uh, I got some funding um, uh, after fail uh, at the COI and also at the PI, um, I got uh, two different uh, one is from Innovate UK and at the U UCL PI. And this one in collaboration with a company. And also like I try to reach out with them, send on them an email. I mean, during that time, also during the pandemic, it's very difficult. You, we mostly have a meeting online, but if not, I, I prefer to, to go to talk to them in person. And also like we can build up with some uh, funding together. And another funding is EPSRC. So I got a EPSRC a scholarship award that can support a PhD student uh, for four years to work on the project. Uh, I'm very, very interesting. So uh, some key uh, thoughts about myself. So actually there's no, no fixed uh, procedure. And actually for me, there's no approved path. Everything is from your experience. You learn from here and there, you learn from some event like this, or you go to talk to people, so you learn. So there's no uh, approved path. And there's no guarantee. 
because it's not like when you um, submit, for example, at my experience, just uh, last month, I submitted um, a grant and I, I feel like I'm, I feel quite confident about that and I feel, okay, it's perfect. It's, we, we're going to get this grant, but eventually uh, I fail again. So um, for me, you need to be good and lucky. So, and no matter what, you just keep going, going because uh, it can be done, has been done and it will be done again and again. So you just keep going, try to improve, get feedback and apply again. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you can, one day you can get the funding that you want. So um, thank you very much for your listening. And I hope I can cover some of the main point uh, for this topic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ling, for a very interesting and insightful presentation, sharing with us uh, experiences uh, of not just only successful, but also unsuccessful applications, right? And at the end, I think I like your your last um, bullet point where you said that you need to keep go keep going because uh, in this game, then it's tough and, and you have to overcome challenges and in the end, you will get successes. So, so far we have um, listened to a presentation from the perspective of API. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions for Ling, but maybe we can reserve them for the later section on the Q&A at the end. But let uh, us now turn to another presentation and here we are going to focus on the perspective of a reviewer. So what do reviewers look for in an application? And I would like to invite um, Dr. Sun Pham, who is currently doing a lecturer at Imperial, and he would like to, he would be able to share with us some uh, experiences uh, from his perspective. So please, can you uh, share your screen, Sun? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, uh, I will share screen now. So hopefully you see my screen. Um, is it okay, isn't it? Can you see my screen? Yeah, uh, yeah thank you. Uh, okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Again, I get, I, uh, and uh, the base for, uh, for organizing this event. Um, so this um, this about me. The, uh, my name is Ming Sun Pham. I'm from Imperial College in London. Um, so in this um, talk, I just want to show, I mean, share some of my personal experience uh, being a reviewer. Uh, at different um, um, funding schemes and also funders as well. Um, so first of all, just just uh, the content of my talk uh, is about me as a reviewer, and then I will um, describe normally what I'm looking for uh, when I review a pay, uh, review a uh, grant application, and also some tips uh, for writing a grant, and also I give some insights uh, when I sit uh, when I start some panel meeting in particular for uh, European Research Council or National Science Foundation US, in USA, but I also have some experience uh, of uh, reviewing application for VNIF as well. So here's a bit about me. Um, so over the past probably uh, eight years, I'm a reviewer for uh, different funders in the UK, like the Royal Society of Science um, or Royal Academy of Engineering. Normally that for the fellowship uh, application, so basically that's to fund API. Uh, and also I review um, grant application for the EPSRC, that's Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK, and also some networking grants um, funded by British Council. Um, and um, not only in the UK, but also I review um, grants for the, uh, in, uh, from USA, uh, from National Science Foundation, NSF, or also German Research Foundation in Germany as well, and Czech Republic, uh, and, and uh, also European Research Council, which is the main fund, uh, funding scheme in, uh, in, the, uh, in Europe, uh, and have some experience with uh, reviewing application for the um, BIN-IF, um, in particular for research grant, but also for PhD scholarship or postdoc uh, studies in Vietnam as well. So, so normally what I, when I receive an application, uh, when I open application, uh, that depends on the funding call. Um, so that is as uh, Ling mentioned about, you need to check the uh, the funding scheme carefully. Um, so for fellowship application, for example, from, come from Royal Society of Science or Royal Academy of Engineering, but also the VNIF uh, postdoc uh, fund as well. So with that normally, and first of all, I, um, in the end, um, the funder want to fund science, and but also they want to fund the BI as well. That's in particular for fellowship. So I will talk about 
uh, what we often review when we look at the quality of the applicants. Uh, but first of all, that's about science. Um, so I'm really looking for something interesting, something that makes me excited. And they need to answer the question, why, why, why do I care? Um, why, is, why is important scientific questions? What is really exciting me here? What the, the, the hypothesis here? So we really need to uh, focus on, uh, on the background and motivation. Really, that needs to uh, excite me. Uh, and articulate the scientific questions that need to be very quite focused and defined uh, and then uh, show the um, your, your goal and the defined objective. So what do you really want to promise to deliver and achieve after say three or five years? And then you focus on the hypothesis. I think that's very important because if we, um, I mean, I made a lot of mistake uh, in my uh, application writing as well. But now I realize it's uh, something when, when you have hypothesis, say, if we do X, we could get Y. And Y is, is significant because Y could help us to answer the question for Z. And that is really uh, the a review looking for. And um, and if I see any wow factors, so that's something is very exciting, then that really, I mean, if I see that it's beautiful science, then um, it it it's, uh, it impressed me, uh, and uh, that could um, kind of get my support as well. And then afterwards, I look uh, at the approach, so um, the applicants' approach, so whether they identify the right methods or not. So because it depends on their scope and also their hypothesis, I will check the methods carefully, whether they miss any key methods or they just um, propose to do a lot of experiments, so that clearly um, that is um, not necessary. And from the method, I look at their work packages, so they identify that if they use the me methods X, then um, they could do some certain experiments uh, related to that method. So I could check the, the, the work package carefully and in relation to the proposed methods they, um, they want to use. And because that is fellowship application, um, 50% of my focus also on the quality of applicants. So um, I want to check with that, uh, that is outstanding applicants. So that really depends on the track record, uh, the previous original papers. So that really we focus on not kind of the, the review papers, we focus on the original papers. Uh, we, um, I'm not paying attention too much about the uh, citation or the, the number of papers, but I care about the quality of papers that they publish. Uh, and also, if they got the uh, the scholarship awards, like prizes or and um, and honors they receive from recognized societies, and because we want to fund uh, uh, the leader, the outstanding researcher, and who are the leaders in future, so the, uh, I I I also check very carefully about their vision and where they want to be in five years or ten years. Um, and in the end, uh, if they have beautiful science, if they propose the right methods and identify the um, appropriate work packages, then I would check the capability of, uh, of them to deliver. To make sure that is after five years, uh, as they promised, they could able to deliver to achieve what they uh, want to achieve. And that really now need, we need to check about their expert, expertise, the relevant uh, of um, relevant to what they propose in their application. And because that's fund the PI, the principal investigator, then now we need to check because in beginning normally if they apply for postdoc or the fellowship of Royal Society of Science, I need to check whether they are uh, have very good independency. So they need to show they are now get get uh, they regrow up, they be um, be independent from their supervisors whether that uh, PhD supervisor or, or postdoc supervisor, and now they are be of, uh, of their own. So that the independence is that's very important. And, and again, this one is leadership, so that is um, related aligned to the future vision. So we want to, uh, we want to fund a, uh, a leader in the future. And certainly because of that fellowship, um, they, um, they are a single PI uh, and they need to, and also they start to build up their own research so they need to get quite a lot of support to come from their host as well. So I, we check the letter of support come from their host, whether they have very good environment to support a new PI or not, uh, or they provide appropriate mentor, uh, mentoring ship to their PI. Uh, and if the, if the if applicant get the funds, then how the uh, 
the Haas Institute supported them throughout the, not only one year, but also throughout the five years and, and also in the future, where the, after five years, the Haas Institute could offer that PI a permanent position or not. So that's very important uh, for application for fellowship. And then, uh, and then uh, the other thing is very, very much is uh, it's quite minor though. I would check if it's feasible or not. Uh, so that depends on the defined objectives. So it depends on what you propose in the beginning here, the objective of the application, and how many uh, amount of work undertaken in this uh, um, in this proposal, and check again about the applicant's capability, and then uh, cross check with the request resources. So if you aim too much and you um, request because of the limits of the budget, you're not able to request uh, a lot of resources and support, then it clearly it's difficult for you to deliver. So you need to balance, uh, very carefully balance between what you want to achieve, uh, what you want to do, and the, uh, the, the, the availability of resources and support you got from, uh, from funder, but also from the host instit institute as well. And then certainly with the Request that resources you need to justify what you request from the funder. So that is about the, the fellowship applications, and it's quite applicable for kind of postdoc application uh, if you want to apply for like a VNIF uh, postdoc uh, fund. Now, um, moving to another uh, type of uh, uh, application for grants that is research proposal, and that is um, that's what I um, I observed from my uh, my experience from NSF, EBSRC, or the uh, German Research Foundation, and also the VNIF as well. So for the research grants, again, in the end, it's all about all, all about the science. So I, I very much focus on the uh, the story. So we need to present very uh, exciting, but it's very focused story. So we need to articulate, formulate the story very carefully show the background motivation and, and explain to me why that is important, um, need, um, important questions need to be answered. And then you need to show very um, um, significant and interesting hypothesis. And again, that is with that hypothesis say, if I do X, if the X is true, then then why uh, is, is the result of X and the uh, Y is the solution for me to answer the question I articulated earlier. In my in my background, in the story I formulated, and you have exciting ideas. Then, uh, then so that's the first big step to convince a reviewer. And and then you, um, again, that is need to very well defined goal as objective. We can't answer everything. We can't solve every problem in one proposal. So you need to convince me uh, or convince a reviewer that is interesting story, important questions to answer. Uh, but here is my goal. I want to achieve. X and Y and Z because X and Y and Z the key factors that keep uh, that help me to find the answer for the question I raised earlier. Um, and afterwards is everything about your approach, your methodology, how you um, um, formulate, how you identify the work packages and allocate the time, allocate your resources, uh, and allocate the team as well. And uh, and then with the work packages and the methods, you need to identify the right equipment. Uh, right amount of cons consumables uh, and um, the timeline when, when you uh, allocate your time to uh, tackle different problems or different experiments. And because this one research grant, um, that is uh, a team here is not only one single investigator that can uh, be multiple investiga investigators. That is quite common in the UK. So normally one research grant consists of like three to, five, uh, three to four applicants um, and they join together, they share uh, the complementary uh, skills and they have very good record in different kind of complementary directions. So, so that is um, a review would check, would check the track records of the team and to check the, um, the previous publications and the scholarship, they uh, are, are being recognized for their field. And because that's a team, that's multiple investigators. So a reviewer would check whether they uh, they have a good overlapping, but it's very much complementary. So they, 
that, that not I mean not everyone have the same skill because if there's every every member in the team has same skill then that means there's no need to have a team so that's only need one one PI here so be careful when you invite anyone to join your team uh, you need to show that is um, we have very common uh, research interest but each um, investigator should have different unique skills and they complement to the others. Um, and their skills and their expertise need to be relevant to the identify work packages and methods they present earlier. And afterwards, it's very much it's just to double check about the feasibility, whether they what they propose is sensible within the time limit uh, and justification for resources. And the, the last um, funding scheme or type of funding I reviewed over the past few years is a network, uh, network proposal. Um, so for network proposal, it's, it's less about science, it's more about um, the impact, but you still need to formulate a story here. So again, every proposal is about a story that is interesting or meaningful or impactful story. So that is, in uh, we need to uh, present the background and, and motivation, explain why that's important to, uh, to do that kind of networking uh, and, and clearly need to be very focused because we could not cover everything. Uh, we start because networking, that means we establish a network and we start from a scratch. And that means we need to slowly and step by step and very define the way we uh, we go in the future. And in terms of the approach is quite quite straightforward because if networking grant, so that means normally that's, uh, um, the approach is to be uh, just visit between two uh, different institutes and exchange the knowledge, exchange uh, staff members, and organize a workshop with a, a focus on a, a given scientific topics. Um, and then you allocate uh, the work and uh, set the timeline. Now for the net networking grant, in particular for like a British Council between the UK and Vietnam, we we uh, we need to consider like in inclusivity. So that is uh, also equality as well. So we have very, very good uh, representation of different um, groups, like um, from uh, different genders and different backgrounds, uh, different regions in Vietnam, for example, from the north, central, or the south of Vietnam. So, so that you need to, uh, to have a lot of thought into that is inclusivity and the diversity of, uh, of your proposal, of your um, application. And then double check about the ODA compliance. Now, and, and then I also check the record of applicants and their relevant expertise because they want to establish a, a network or they want to exchange knowledge, then really we want to see how relevant of their expertise um, involved in this um, exercise or, or their proposed activities. And I will look at the, uh, the balance of gender and also diversity of the, uh, of the application, uh, applicant's team. And this one normally is much um, less uh, undertaking comparison to the fellowship or to the research proposal, but it's, it's need, need to focus more about the impact and the meaning, meaning of your application. So few tips for the grant uh, for grant writing. Uh, when also as a um, grant writer, um, normally I need to answer the four questions. The first question is is what. What a story, what, uh, what's interesting story here? What's important scientific questions we want to answer? What are really kind of exciting hypotheses? And what do you want to achieve? After three or four years, um, what we really want, uh, what really want to achieve here, that is very much about your objective and the key deliverables. And the, the next question is why? Why is your research important and significant? And, uh, and that's very much about background motivation. And the next question, why is why now? So why, why, do, why does someone else propose to do that earlier or later? It's very much it's about the timeliness because it's the right time to do that. So we need to clearly um, explain and describe the, the timeliness of your application. And the third question is how? It's about the approach, methodology, the task allocation. So how how that exciting scientific question that is um, is wonderful hypothesis, but how we can achieve that, and that now you need to clearly uh, identify the uh, the key methods, and also describe the task, 
and how you allocate the task resources and the time throughout because we have time limit, we have the budget limit, also have a, the resources limit as well. So that we need to be very carefully answer the question how. And the last question is who, who you are and who are the team. And that is very, uh, it's about to track record, your expertise, and in it describe it, not only you are qualified, but also your excellent uh, team to deliver that project because you want to see the, the value for money. So they want to fund you with, let's say, 2 million pounds, but they want to achieve as much as possible. They want to see the team that able to deliver the most. So that is, uh, that's a four questions normally. Uh, as a reviewer, we want to, to find the, uh, the answers for that four questions, but also as a writer, we need to answer that as well. Now, um, for the also tip for writing, so really need first of all when you write as Ling mentioned, you need to identify the type of the of the fund, whether that fellowship or research grant or network grants, and then check the theme, check the topic of that funder of the funding um, scheme. So first of all, I here I show you here the topic, the theme of the Ayrton fund, and that is uh, they clearly articulate about uh, what they want to fund, like a low carbon supplies. Or the uh, or the super uh, super efficiency demand about about energy efficiency or clean transport. So you need to check that carefully and and you need to write your application aligned with their with their themes. And then check eligibility and the budget limit. Now go back to the grant writing. So when you really identify the uh, the right uh, funding scheme and you know you are eligible for that, then you now you start to write. And, uh, and then again, uh, writing a grant is a writing story. So with our story, then it's very difficult to know where, uh, where we are he heading to. And that story needs to be exciting, meaningful, and significant. And throughout the whole writing, you need to show your passion. I mean, if, before you can convince a reviewer to be enthused about uh, your idea, then you need to be motivated and enthused first. So you need to show the passion throughout the whole writing. And then uh, make sure that is you proofread your application, ensure that it's almost free of typo or grammatical errors, uh, because I hear just a, a cartoon here. I mean, uh, as a reviewer, we only fund or we only support any application that we understand their ideas and their story. So make sure that every part is flow very well and connect to the other, support the other arguments. Use the plain language, avoid jargons, so, uh, and also avoid, I mean, use acronym, but make sure you define that. And don't ask the, uh, don't ask reviewer to, to define that yourself, or don't, don't just make them feel puzzled about uh, acronyms. And write your proposal concisely with coherence. Now, here's just a few insights about um, uh, a panel meeting. Um, I were um, at a few panel meetings for ERC Horizon 2020, but also VNIF as well and National Science Foundation in USA. So normally each panel member, they have a list of, uh, of applications. So normally they would select one or two if the, uh, if the funding is good, but normally there's only one they would su strongly support. So they rank, they rank very high and they, they would try to convince other panel members to support that proposal. So normally when they come to any panel meeting, they already have uh, something in their mind, what they want to fund. So, um, so that is, you want to be in this list here, the list number one, that is the strong application, get support, come, uh, support from the panel member. And that's uh, the second category, that is uh, some proposal, I would think this is fundable. Uh, if there's a, a funding limit is good, uh, then we can fund more. And that's at least it's, it's, I think it's, it's not fundable. So that clearly just 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 gone. And normally uh, for the um, competitive um, funding scheme, uh, each proposal normally assigned to two to four reviews, and there might be one review be a lead review, and that lead review would collect all the feedback and write a summary, and then they could lead to the discussion whether they support any applicants. They could that is would be a key panel member because their weight uh, they carry a lot of weight in their in the discussion. 
And the other panel discussion is, um, as I mentioned, each uh, member, they will present a case to support for their application they strongly support. Um, and, um, and they try to convince other panel members to support um, the proposal they like. And they could provide uh, uh, opinion and critical feedback to other proposal uh, they don't support. Uh, and you see that's very dynamic, dynamic because uh, at the panel meeting, uh, opinion might be changed from some proposal they might put in the category category two, but then they can move to the category one or, the, or, or they can put that into category three. So that depends on the feedback they receive from other previews as well and also the dynamic uh, at the panel meeting. And I think that's, that's it about um, my per personal per perspective as a reviewer. So I, I want to thank you for attention. Um, but um, very importantly, it's best of luck to all of us, not only you, but also me as well. And I, I think that's all we need uh, in the getting grants. And uh, very happy to answer the question later. Thank you very much, uh, Sun, for sharing your insights as a reviewer and also uh, showing us how reviewers work, what re uh, criteria or requirements they have. Seem to be quite a tough process, isn't it? And, and that might explain why the success rate is, is very, very um, low. Uh, but I, I guess, uh, I hope and really hope that uh, the insights you have shared today will help um, our applicants um, to improve the applications and increase the chance of success in the future. But uh, let's now turn to our final presentation and um, I would like to invite Professor Anne Nguyen at uh, Bournemouth. He's a professor of um, journalism and public communication. So unlike the first uh, two speakers, um, Ang An, he's um, an expert in humanities, arts, and, and, um, and he will share um, with us his perspectives from a more seasoned PI. So over to you, Ang An. Okay, guys, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, just to correct, I'm not an arts or humanities guy. I'm a social scientist. <laughs> so so Indeed, I'm a sociologist sorry. myself. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, you know I'm, although I'm, I'm a bit, you know, things like in, in, related to humanities and arts, but uh, not that much. Um, uh, I am a mainly a social media sociologist um, looking at uh, science communication, health communication, journalism, um, development communication uh, is uh, very difficult in terms of, you know, right, I, I came here in a position actually to respond to the first two guys, but there are, rather than last night, I thought, okay, there are a lot of the differences between, you know, social sciences and the natural, you know, the, the hard sciences, you know, in terms of funding. And so I did a bit of the uh, you know, uh, repair a, bit, a few slides to talk to you mainly about social science. Well, there are, you know, a lot of overlapping, but, you know, there's something that I might want to highlight, um, uh, um, you know, in relation to what you do when you apply for a research grant in, in social sciences, um, you know. Um, so I, I, my career has been mainly, you know, in, you know, um, probably until now, I've, I've got about, 1.5, 1.6 .1 million pounds in terms of um, funding from external sources, SPI. I'm not counting co-I here. Co-I is very different, you know. Sometimes you don't really need to do a lot as a co-I, but as a PI, you know. The other guys have said, you know, a link was traffic, you, you do most of the work. So um, um, so I'm going to, uh, maybe I need to share my slide, I think. One second. How long do we have? Is I think it's a bit overrun now, isn't it? Yeah, so we have up until um, half past nine, including the Q&A. But I think you could, you know, maybe finish at around uh, 20 past nine, if that's all right. Okay. Uh, is it, I cannot share. Why is it I can't share? Um, because I'm not a co-host or? Let me check. Um, you should be a co-host. Um, yeah. I think I can see that you are a co-host. Hang on. Um, would you like to try again? Uh, now it does. Okay, good. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, so I'm actually doing this because I this is a, 
a set of slides that we, I have a, a mentoring program myself with the British Academy funding. So at the moment, I'm, mentor, I'm, I'm in charge of project, you know, uh, training and mentoring about 40 media and communication scholars across 14 universities in Vietnam to do academic publishing and grant writing. So this is actually, this came from uh, my and my colleague, uh, Dan Jackson, who is a professor uh, at Walmart too, last week, uh, well, last month in Vietnam, in Da Nang, as part of the uh, the British Academic grant. So I'm going to go through these tips a little bit, you know, not all of them, but, you know, just, just some of the key things. I think one of the things we, um, so, I mean, very often when we got to a grant call, a funding call, okay, there's some relation here. Okay, we should go for this, but don't ever do get into applying until you really are very, very clear that your ideas are a good answer, a very clear and definite answer to the, the to, to the rabbit, which is the what they what the funding call is about. Is it about you know? You know the impact of you know about responsible technology. Is it about climate change? You know, uh, uh, inclusion or whatever, a social justice or whatever. With every funding call and every uh, funding council or uh, organization, will have a very different kind of you know strategic uh, rabbit. And your application is not a research proposal in itself. Well, it is. It's much more than that. It's more about you know how your research your proposed research actually fits into what the funder wants. So, okay, it's important, I mean, but Sen was talking about, you know, it's the scientific, you know, uh, aspect of this, which is the key, of course. It's essential, but that's not enough for, at least in the social sciences, you need to show that, okay, you need to justify that, okay, this is what you want, the funder want. This is what we are going to do, and this fits into that very well. Uh, and so, so basically, I'm sorry, I'm just so your objective is research, but actually, it's more you know when you apply for for funding, it's more of a career. You don't get promotion you that quick if you don't get money. It's about your livelihood because you know it's all about that. And I'm not saying that, you know, it's not just not research, but, you know, it's that one of those things, you know, funding a very, uh, I mean, Lin were mentioning a, a series of, of, of unsuccessful applications before she got the first one, which is very normal, the 10, 15 percent, you spend a whole lot of your time, you know, one year to repair, put it in, and then one year to wait and respond to reviewers, and in the end, you don't get the money. You know, it's very, very consuming, time consuming, it's very uh, exhorting and the success is very, very low. I, would, I, I, I don't want to use the term failure. If, when you talk about research funding, you know, it's, there is no failure. You might have unsuccessful application, but that doesn't mean, you know, you might, you come up with a good application, but you won't get the funding. <laughs> not because you are not good, you know, your research proposal is not good uh, enough. It's just maybe because they don't have enough money to fund. It's maybe, and mainly, it's most of the time, it's about the strategic aims and objectives, you know. So, so when you have proposal coming, you know, and you have very kind of equally important, you know, uh, you know, equal quality or similar quality, you know, that's going to be, you know, the key thing. So, so, the rationale for your project is important. Why do we need it? What are the benefits to society, to the stakeholders involved in your, you know, uh, in your project? You know, members of public, the the journalism profession, or you know, um, the health profession, or whatever. So your idea will be bought or not depends very much on whether your idea is linked to a specific goal, whether it is a fit to the funder priorities, and importantly, before you do anything, check on their previous funding, you know, your funded project, because sometimes you come up with a great idea, you decide you spend months, and then it turns out that bloody somebody else has already done that and got funding from this council already, which happens. You know? So check it. 
second tip, don't set out. I mean, never set out to write a grant application. You build it. And building means, you know, it is brick by brick. It's argument by argument, justification by justification, you know. You create kind of a by kind of a wall of defense. And don't let you don't let the assessor, your reviewers to okay, to think or to okay, be critically okay about whatever you are they are reading. Don't leave them the, the space. Well, of course, you will leave that. Of course, you won't avoid all of that, but always you know try to cover all of the holes. Build that wall of defense throughout your narrative. I don't go, don't want to go too, too much into this, but this is a, a kind of the cycle of argument and justification in the document. You know, you start, with, this is the problem, and the problem is this is the need and the, you know, the fit to the pyramid and, you know, return to all investment. So this is the problem. Where are we in terms of research? You know, the, the state of the art, what is needed? And then you go to the, which is the rational project, and then you go from there, you go to objectives, and in order to achieve that op uh, objective, what is the methodology? How are you going to achieve that? How are you going to do it? How do you uh, how, how are you going to organize the, the, your project? And importantly, what are your outputs? What are the, your your, your deliverable, uh, deliverables? What are the and then what are and what do the deliverables the output you know can make an impact on society on the community on the on the, the stakeholder whoever you are you know whichever community you are talking about okay and how does it resolve the problem that you mentioned earlier uh, from the beginning when we build we are talking about writing narrating but we also talking about evidence. We argue, but you know, we, we we write in a way that okay, get people to agree with us with evidence. Now, this is this is an example from my BA grant that I mentioned earlier, which I got I got the money for that, you know, to 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 train the third of about 40 media communication scholars, where you know you you, you write clearly, but you build a narrative, a story in it. I think Shen, Shen was mentioning the, the, the term story, which I, I like it, you know, because it's about storytelling. Storytelling based on data, based on facts, and that's what we do, you know. So we size a lot of figures, numbers, or whatever, and then you know, but build it up over, you know, the, the the proposal. Usually, you know, that is also another kind of building bricks, you know, which is you know, put them into work packages, you know. Every package will have a justification, a description, an outcome, a. Uh, you know, a purpose and then a, a set of deliverables, you know, and they all have to be linked together. You know, every package will need to link to the others to come up to the last, you know, uh, you know, to your, your research question. This is a bit, you know, like a bit, you know, but do act as a salesperson. You are not writing a, a research proposal for a PhD or whatever. You are actually do uh, selling your ideas. We are selling the ideas to the funder who has something, you know, a scheme to, to fund us, you know. So give them the impression that you know everything in detail and you know what you are going to do, you know why and why you are going to be able to deliver, you know. So don't say, oh, we seek to do this, we intend to do this, say we will, for example. We will do this, we will do that. Don't say we probably do this or we probably do that but whatever you do whether as a sales person or not don't ever rag don't ever boast about you know this is a cutting edge kind of study or whatever without evidence you know it might well be but you need to show that think about the impact and benefit from the very outset because that without i think in social science in humanities you won't be able to get money if you don't show the impact and the benefits which means, you know, about, uh, you know, how do you, you know, what are the concrete and tangible delivery, uh, deliveries that you are going to offer? And you do it from the very beginning of your document. You know, this is, this is a summary of a, of a project that I got from AHRC a couple of years ago, where I summarized, I mentioned all the, I mentioned all the, um, you know, the, the aims, the objective, the, the state of the art, 
and the impacts and the partners, all of them in one, you know, in these the 250 words, you know, because if you don't, you start from there because that's how you organize your team. That's how you talk to partners. What's, that's how you build your team, you know, with a partner from no, from outside academia, you are very unlikely to get any, you know, uh, you know, uh, funding, to be honest. Don't ever assume that all every assessor are experts. Not always. I can tell you that most of the cases, you know, at least one of your reviewers is not going to be an expert in your field. And also the panel members, none of them are going to be assumed that none of them are going to be your an expert in, in, in your areas. They are very generic, you know, they are, you know, they are there to base on the reviewers' comments and then, you know, okay, use their own kind of background knowledge. So what that means is don't be too over ambitious, you know, or don't be too don't be all over the place. Too many aims, too many objectives. They won't have time. They don't have the stitch, you know, loads to 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 to, to we all these things together, you know. Be clear. And don't keep them waiting to see the significance of something you said and then write it. Talk, you know, mention that immediately when you mention, you know, when you talk about that, you know. And I think uh, CERN also mentioned things about jargons and all those things, you know. Um, don't forget the presentation matter. I mean, most of the funding, electronic funding systems are very weird, you know. It makes it hard for you to, for us to, to, to present. But, you know, my tip is, once you have already had the first draft on the system, print it out on PDF, check and check and check, and then, you know, try to use some of the, you know, common, uh, uh, um, you know, tools like bullet points or whatever, you know, whatever you can try to separate uh, ideas from one to another. And I think most of the case, remember, double check, all elements, uh, essential elements are covered or not, because most projects are not successful because not what because what they say what what you say the proposal important but you know what you don't say actually is the very 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 likely to be the key the, the core the, the the reason for you to, to not to succeed in your grant application you know um this is some from you know I, this is a document that I'm, you know from a a, a book uh, that I think I did mention there for you if you want to look at later um so. It's a competition, remember that. You must be the best, with the best idea. And don't ever rush, you know. I think it takes time, as Lin and, and Sun were talking about, you know. So that's it for me, and uh, happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Engan. And in particular, very useful to, to hear from you. Uh, as you mentioned, you have many experiences winning um, many um, grant applications. So the tips and the experiences you've shared, I'm sure will, will be very helpful to the early career researchers. Um, so I think now we could maybe open the floor for uh, the Q&A session. I think there's already a question from the chat. So I'm gonna um, ask our speakers, Ling, um, as well maybe because you are um, have just experienced, right? Um, your experience as a new PI. I think there's a question from uh, Alice. Yes. Asking what advice you might have for early career researchers when writing future vision career plans. Yes. So uh, for me, uh, for my experience, uh, first of all, you have to set a clear goal. So it's considered a short term uh, goal and long term. So, for example, you can mention like after you uh, finish the project, what will you do? Maybe publish the paper, patent. For long term, you have to think about like, Maybe you get a permanent position, you need to be a leader, lead a research team in the field and get promotions. You have to be very clear about that. And also like you have to show your passion and interest because like what are you truly uh, interested about? What topic or questions that excite you? So your future vision will be should be aligned with your interest. And you have to mention about that and to ensure the long term is full fulfillment and motivation. And also like you have to think um the 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 funding scheme, what will they bring, what will they allow you to do? So if you you have a goal and then what can they help you, support you 
So you have to be very clear about that if you have any information in detail specific. And the most important is you have to mention about the mentorship. Like this, you have to look for a mentor. So who can provide guidance if you have a mentor or if not, you can should mention like this scheme. If I get the funding, I will have access to a mentorship uh, from the, the funding that they will provide me and support me. So uh, for, for my uh, career development. So that, that is all for my experience. I hope um, Zeng and uh, Anan can add more uh, point for this. Excellent. Thank you, Ling. Um, so from the perspective of a reviewer, so, so when you look at applications uh, involving early career researchers, then can you share with us, um, you know, potential insights or what you are looking for, essentially, when you are reading the section around their vision or career paths? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, I think that's that's very, very excellent question. When I look at um, the career path, uh, first of all, we check the check of record to see uh, whether they're able to produce kind of original research. So that's very important. Actually, a lot of people, they got very high number of citations because they write, uh, I mean, their research fields in very kind of hot topic or they write a lot of review papers, which is not very much about original research. So I, I want to see the originality in their research. Uh, and second thing, I want to see whether they able to kind of deliver independent research or not. So because actually, a lot of applicants, they come from very strong research groups and where they have got, got a lot of support come for their supervisor. And very difficult to see whether that's uh, the research or publication they, they published earlier, how much come from their contribution. So I want to get some kind of confidence if the uh, applicants convince me they are uh, contribute more to the research and they let their, the past research and they're able to deliver the future research independently. Then, uh, then I want to see that kind of confidence uh, and the next step I would check is the, the vision, where they want to be in the next, let's say, five or ten years. So actually, most of fellowship grants, they, they fund for five years, but they want to see the researcher in ten years. So they we want to fund the, the leader in the future. So so everything in the applic application, the applicants need to convince a reviewer. Uh, first of all, I'm an originality and independence to lead the future research uh, without support come from their supervisor. And they they want to show that they are leading expert in the future. Okay, excellent. Thank you, sir. And can I ask, uh, Ang An, because I believe, as you said, you have um, some grants working with um, colleagues in Vietnam, including potentially early career researchers. Right. So, what advice? What advice do you do you have for for those colleagues, in particular, when they, they are going to develop their the first, let's say, first grant as a PI in the future? Um, what pitfalls that they might need to look out for, and then how do they, let's say, sharpen the application? I think the key thing is you 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 need to be ahead of your time. Either way, you know. I mean, in a way, it's a it's a, an advantage of those who are newcomers. <laughs> You you can see you know you are not you know influenced by the kind of old way of thinking already established in in your you, you know in 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 the in the you know uh, discipline you are actually you know going to join. So I mean, vision is about okay, what will happen? I think I'm going to this area, you know, because it's going to be blah blah blah. You know, for the future, climate change is going to be you know. Um, it's, it's, it's a huge problem now globally everybody knows that but how do we get this to people you know how do we uh let's say you know it will create a lot of you know social injustice you know in vietnam or in the Mekong delta or whatever okay and i'm going to into this area because i want to fix the problem and fix the problem in you know an innovative kind of way that said, I mean, this is not the vision thing and show your passion. You know, when you talk about that, you actually show your passion. You know, you are, you care not just about the research itself, but also the people who are affected by the research. You know, I think that is the, uh, from the social sciences perspective, I, I would say, you know, um, that said, I, I tell you what, I, I, when I first set foot in, 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 in the UK about, I think, 16 years ago as a lecturer after my PhD, straight after my PhD in Australia, and I apply for uh, 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 what they call the, at, this, at, the, at the time is the ESRC first grant, which is for early career kind of. It's not a fellowship, it's a first grant. 
and I got at the time I got three A star and one A by the reviewers. And then when it came to the panel, they didn't fund it. And what was the reason? This research has so much potential for commercial uh, sectors. Why do we have to fund this? And this bloody hell, you know, I mean, what's the point? You know, after that, the, the same idea, I can tell you the same ideas that I came up in that proposal became, you know, Oxford got, uh, got funding from Google, from uh, Facebook to set up their own research center called the Reuters Institute and to do this every year since, you know, in the past 15, 14, 15, 30 years. But even the idea that I came, I mean, I'm not saying that they got my idea, my idea is still, you know, the same kind of thing that you can foresee, you know, foresee, you know, maybe when you, it hit the world because those people, those guys who are on the panels might not be, okay, right. But this is for commercial company to explore, not for a research funding council, you know, you know, it's, so, so anyway, that's the kind of thing that I would, you know, be visionary, be passionate. You might not get it now. I'm not saying this is a failure. I have a colleague at my at my university who had who just got a, a Marie Curie, um, uh, uh, you know, fellowship uh, grant for, and how many times did she put in the application? That was the fourth time for the same proposal for the same scheme. That she got it, and she's a, a, a professor. She, she was applying for a fellowship for somebody else, a Marie Curie uh, fellowship. So you don't, uh, uh, you guys were talking about we persevere, you know, keep trying, keep trying. If you don't get this time, you know, change it, submit it next time, or submit it to another funder. Mm. You know, there are calls coming. Just keep an eye on everything. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Engan, in particular, um, on sharing even a very painful experience. But uh, I guess, you know, as we have seen, everybody will have um, certain setbacks and the key is to overcome these challenges. I believe there's another question from the audience. Um, Tao Nguyen, would you like to um, unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sun and Ms. Sling. I, I have a question. I mean, uh, recently when I applied for the co, um, there's a 20% of the UK institution to contribute to the fund. I know that the um, the research office want to support this, but I don't know how to put the costing. You know, we need to prepare the costing. We send the, the, the research sort of Are you in the Vietnam costing or and they are you based from Vietnam? You so, to Vietnam? I'm in the UK. I'm in the UK. Yeah. So um, um, uh, it's just any clue if you can, if you can, uh, you know, elaborate on the twenty percent of the, the the funding cost, and the second question is: I I realized that recently, um, the the UK government and like uh, the funding like British Council, uh, UK uh, British Academy, they fund quite a lot for the climate change, um, and um, we we plan to do some collaboration with the Vietnamese uh, colleges. So, is there any tip or hints uh, from the um, uh, the panel on you know like the reviewer? That's your experience on on the application. And Great, on the thank you, Tom. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, would you like to answer the first question and maybe the second question? I can uh, direct that to CERN, given that CERN has uh, shown a great interest in uh, the area of climate change and he's organizing some events around that. Mm. Hang on. Well, I, to you apply for funding uh, from a UK institution, right? Am I clear? About yes, that? I think Tao is from the UK. Yes, he's at Nottingham, okay. I believe. Yeah. So that's twenty percent is is taken for granted. Every council we ask, we only fund eighty percent of the, the 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 total research costs, and the twenty percent actually basically is overhead and all the thing. You know, it's still uh, you know for for research councils they. You know, they ask for twenty percent, but actually, you know, you know, so, so uh, for practically your research office, your case, you know, officer, support officer, we will, will handle all of this. You know, when they do the costing, anyway. You know, um, I'm just wanted to say that you know, it's you know, usually UK, you know, say they they charge an overhead of about fifty, <laughs> about around fifty percent, which means you know, you they you know, any money you get in. They say eighty percent, but actually they still get a lot of 
you know, it's still a lucrative kind of, you know, source of income for them because uh, the, 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 the total uh, value of the grant may be, okay, 200,000, for example. Almost half of that is already overhead and all those things. And then also your time, you know, your time is actually whether you get the grant or not, it's still being paid, right? <laughs> You know your salary is paid whether you get a grant or not. So, so, so the you the you know they get well, they encourage us to do and you know kind of force us to, to apply for grant because of this. You know, if you want to promote it to, to get promotion because of you know it's, it's you know money from nowhere. Well, uh, money from somewhere to 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 to, to kind of you know um, feel on the um, you know to to add up to what they have to spend otherwise anyway. So that twenty percent is nothing. Okay, thank you, Heng An, for your perspective. Uh, CERN, would you like to respond to Tao's question on applications in the area of climate change? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Heng Viet and also thank you, Tao, for the question as well. Um, so, I mean, certainly there's a lot of funding currently aligned to climate change or the green energy, so it really depends on expertise, Tao. Um, you find uh, in which direction you can apply to expertise. Um, for example, I just got a grant, just a networking grant, which is not, not much though, to establish a network in high erosion and related technologies between the UK and Vietnam. Uh, and we just got grant last week, or no, no, not last week, but early this week. So that is um, uh, for the kind of green technologies, so hydrogen, green hydrogen, and how we use hydrogen in industrial decarbonization. And we are writing, another, at this moment, we're writing a, another proposal uh, for the Aten Fund, which is much bigger, so a maximum three million pounds, also in hydrogen as well. So we focus on green hydrogen production and how to store hydrogen and distribute hydrogen in the future as well, because it's very challenging and how use hydrogen in uh, industry, industrial decarbonization. So that has come from my, because come my, my expertise, because I work quite a lot with hydrogen interaction uh, between hydrogen and materials. Uh, and now also with other colleagues, also another Vietnamese colleagues in, in the UK, uh, to pull the expertise and, and to develop a proposal with our colleagues in Vietnam. And I'm certainly very happy to, to find a way be able to work together or, 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 or just point you in the direction I think might be of your interest. Thank you, CERN. And as I mentioned, uh, CERN and other members of our vice executive mayor board will, will uh, attempt to organize some sort of events in the future um, in the area of climate change. So, so do watch out for some uh, information in the next few weeks. Um, I think we are running out of time a bit. We are lagging a little behind our schedule, but um, I suppose we can maybe have one one last question, maybe for Fuling from anyone. Um, and Vietnam, can I ask uh, add a little more about the costing? The first question from Tao and of course, of course, actually yes. uh, every in the UK, every uh, university and department uh, they have like finance officer. So uh, you can draft the costing and you can ask them to check uh, if you what what did you do is correctly or not. And also different scheme, they, they have different uh, item to fund. For example, some funding, they don't cover the publication fee. But if you put in there and if nobody help you to check, also there's a reason to get the proposal unsuccessful because you will, they will mention, oh, this one we don't we don't pay for you. So get to know people, I mean, the, uh, the finance officer and ask them to help you to support you for the costing. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Link, for the additional insight. Can I just ask you a quick question as well? Given that you mentioned that um, applying for grants is very, very tough, is time consuming, and the success rate is very low. So, how do you, let's say, divide your time between doing research to publish and then dividing your time to write grants? Because when you write, you know, papers publish, then if you don't get published in one journal, you can maybe try other journals. But with grants, then the chance to recycle is lower, right? So, can you share with us from your perspective? Uh, how do you spend the time? How do you share? How do you, how do you allocate the time to grant writing and paper writing, let's say? This is for me. Yes, please. Yeah, your last question for me. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, this this is like very. Uh, you have to <clears throat> you have to have a calendar. You put on the your schedule in there, and then to make sure like time for writing grant, time to talk to student, time to relax, and to have the work life balance. So. We have to plan ahead, then and follow the your uh, schedule, 
then it will make sure. And uh, of course, I, I know in here academic, we always working late at night because like sometimes there's no nothing like uh, like we don't have anything to do. If we, we want to stop, then there's nothing to do. Always there are work to do for academic. So we have to plan ahead and everything remember to put on the calendar. And it, and um, for me, I mean, mostly I, I spend time at night for the writing. And like I say, I I like uh, prepare in advance. So make sure like uh, follow and uh, make a routine. So every day, just 30 minutes, one hour, but then keep routine. Then later you will see like you build, like uh, Anne -An mentioned, like you have to build slowly, slowly. Then in the end, for example, after one month, then we can see like there's a lot of thing in there to do and also uh sometime i ask my student as well so to see like okay this thing um, will relate to their research so what they can contribute so ask for more support student for also go i everything and also we need to set up a um, regular meeting with the team for example every week or every two weeks and then to talk about okay what what we do like this correct or not and also i i'm looking for uh some support from the university so for example, at UCL, there are some uh, research facilitator. You should, I, I ask them, like introduce to me to somebody which I can talk with to, to, to show them the idea is in the remit of that funding or not. But then when it's failed, then of course we have to try to another funding. And uh, of course there's a lot of funding out there. And, and if we try, then we can find out uh, which one we can submit again um, suitable for the funding. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Link, uh, for the additional tips, uh, especially for our early career researchers in Vietnam. Um, as I mentioned, um, we are a little bit behind uh, our schedule, so I'm sure that there will be many more questions from, from the audience. And if you do have um, those questions, then feel free to get in touch with our speakers. I'm sure they will be happy to, to respond to your emails or questions in the future. But um, let um, let all join me in, in thanking all our speakers for uh, spending their time today with us and sharing very helpful insights and experiences. And I'm sure that these uh, talks and, and uh, discussions will help you in the future with your grant applications. Uh, I believe that we do have a, a break a scheduled, um, and we have a re um, we have another section from um, twenty to ten. But given that we are a bit behind with our schedule, as I said, um, we could perhaps go straight into our next section. And um, the next section will be delivered from a funder's perspective. Do we have the speaker with us for the next section? Yes, yes. he is in the call. Yes, okay, he great. Um, so, Chike Wang, right. would you like to introduce our next speaker? Uh, so, we, we go straight to the next session without break. Or are we having five minutes break now? Um, I would propose that um, maybe we have um, a five minute break. Maybe we could break for five minutes and maybe we return at um, a quarter to 10, if that's all right with everyone. Yeah, thank you very because much. We I have had uh, quite a long for... discussion already. Yeah, so let's, let's return at uh, a quarter you. to 10, please. Yes, uh, Bill, I think you could hear us. So yeah. five minute break. Yeah, thank you very much. No problems. Speak to you shortly. Uh, in the meantime, could I ask uh, Viet Anh and Phương Anh to um, make Bill a host, please, a co-host, please, so he can share? Uh, I think I already am. I have an option to share the screen already. So I think oh, that's thank you. That, yeah. that's great. Thank you very much. In fact, while we're on a break, I'll just test if I can do that because I haven't worked on Zoom for a while and I might have forgotten how it works. Uh, <laughs> so maybe... Does that look like you can see my first slide? Yes, I can okay. see it. Okay. So Thanks. should I just leave it there and then we can go from there to start the break at the end of the break? Rather. Yes, let's do yes. that. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Okay. okay. Yeah.
Okay, so welcome back to our workshop. I hope you have managed uh, to have a nice tea or coffee break. And um, our next section will focus on um, some insights or experiences shared by uh, a funder. So would you like to introduce our speaker for that section? I think Chikwen is probably still uh, having a, a coffee break as we speak. Uh, and, um, I have difficulty turning on my... Um... Yeah, thank you very much, um, Viet Ang. And I would like to... I'm delighted to introduce uh, Bill Burson, who is the head of Partnership Global Wales, and he has... Um, experience working with Vietnamese higher education institution. He has kindly offered to share his insight uh, into how to set up a partnership with Vietnam um, and how to work with Vietnamese higher education institution. At the same time, how to make um, funding application um, for setting up such partnership. I think Bill, uh, floor is yours. Um, you. Please uh, go ahead. Okay, so uh, good morning, Chao Bui San, Toy Lab Bill, Toy Lam Viek, or Global Wales. Now, if I've said that correctly, I hope I've said good morning, I'm Bill, and I work for Global Wales. But if I said anything other than that, I apologize for any potential offense caused. Um, yeah, as, as Kian mentioned, I'm, I'm going to talk through a little bit of what I know about developing international partnerships. Um, this does apply, obviously, between working between Wales, where I am based, and, and Vietnam. But I think they're positions and things I've learned through working on a number of different programs and with a number of different organizations. So I previously worked with British Council. I previously worked for a private education company, and now I work for Universities of Wales on the Global Wales Project. So I think a lot of the perspectives I give will hopefully be applicable, not just to anything you do related back to Vietnam, but things you might do connecting anywhere in the world. Um, I'd also say as well, I might cover some of the same ground. I, I have been able to join for the whole morning. I was able to join for, uh, Professor Anne's session before mine, and I think we might have covered some of the same ground, so I'll skip through that where I can. Um, but I also want to maybe reiterate some of the points that were made there because they're really important. So if I can make my slides move along, which hopefully I can, just to give some background, I, I will share my slides so you don't need to read all of this, but just so you understand where I work and where I'm coming from today. Um, I work for a project called Global Wales, which essentially is a project or series of programs which helps Wales increase its international profile through education and work in a number of key areas with a number of key priorities. So it's about having a strategic and collaborative approach. So with that in mind, we do quite a lot of, actually I'm going to the next slide, um, do quite a lot of work on behalf of our whole group of universities, which are listed there. Some of you may even be positioned at those universities. I'm not sure who got on the call altogether. But it's really about using our connections through those universities to help them develop a, a higher profile in some of the key areas we want to work, whether that's in terms of thematic areas or whether that's in terms of geographical areas. We also have, you know, interest in a few different um, priorities, uh, countries and regions overseas and outside of the UK um, are interested in working with Europe quite broadly, North America, India and underlined there Vietnam and the kind of work we promote through Global Wales are things like recruitment, which maybe is more of a focus in uh, some countries than others. In all the regions we work with and my role is very much focused on partnerships, um, marketing our institutions generally and we also have awarding for scholarships either through our own funding through um, our funder, which is Welsh Government, or we work with our partners like Chevening to co-fund scholarships as well, support scholarship applications. We're really about, as far, in everything we do, supporting collaboration. So by that, I mean developing partnerships. So I'm using the word partnerships a lot, you might realize. And we also look at, as well as those institutional and, institu and individual collaborations, what we can do at a system to system level. And by that, I mean working with not just individual universities, for example, but also networks of universities, networks of um, academics such as yourself, things like the UK, Vietnam, um, HE partnership we're partnered with, and also uh, we have a, an MOU between our government and the Ministry of Education and Training in Vietnam as well. Um, that's enough background. Basically, my, my role in here is really today to talk about how you might go about setting up an international partnership. I'm going to keep it quite high level, 
happy to talk through more things at the end. I've got some time for questions if you like. But the thought, the best place to start would probably be about finding the right people to work with or the right person to work with. And I know it's very easy when, um, I think uh, Professor Anne made a very good point, which is your career will be in some ways defined by how successfully or to the degree to which you are able to bring funding into university. It certainly won't harm your career if you're very good at that. But when we look at the very sort of fundamental elements of finding a partner to work with, I'd always say don't be distracted by the funding and focus on the values and the shared values you have as organisations or as individuals. So um, as that second point make, make, makes clear, I think we want to make sure that if there's a, you know, a, an X thousand pound grant on the line, that we don't go, let's do that because it's that amount of money because that will basically lead you down a path of chasing finances rather than chasing like either fewer academic outcomes or capacity development and things like that. So I think it's important to be aware of those funding kind of levers as ways to develop partnerships, but not to be the focus of what you do. It's much more about having uh, a shared interest, um, joint specialisms or areas of common research interest or innovation interest, having a common cause. So if you're looking at social sciences, you might be looking not so much at developing technologies, but developing thinking. So having a kind of common a theme or, or like I say, a challenge to address. Um, the other thing to do as well is, and this came across in quite a few of the questions and quite a few of the points made already, um, understand how experienced you are. Um, there's nothing wrong with being an experienced. No one, no one is experienced anything until they do it. So if you're new to international partnerships, that's fine. There's a lot to learn, and a lot of that learning is done through making mistakes. So it's always important to make sure that you are connecting if you're in, getting into your first few or your first international partnership with people who've worked either in that country before from within your institution or anywhere, really, and try and get the benefit of the things they've done and the things they've learned. You know, and like I say, you learn a lot more from what goes wrong than what goes right. Um, and if possible, try and learn from things that went wrong for other people to avoid doing them yourself. But certainly don't be afraid to feel like you, you should you should draw on the experience of others because I think it's critical that you really take the benefit of being in a large institution and pull all that experience together because it will help you do things better. And then finally, this is quite difficult to do, especially if you end up, you know, at a networking event and you get on with someone very well. Um, you don't have to commit to every partnership that it looks like is possible on the table. I think it's important to be strategic. Um, talked already about work-life balance. It's very easy to get drawn into you know, developing some kind of working relationship with everyone you get into a, into a conversation with. But if you spread yourself too thinly, if you are with, with too many partners, you will lose value in all of them. And I think it's much better to be honest and say, okay, well, this is a really interesting conversation, but I don't think we have a, either an organizational capacity or maybe our interests aren't as aligned as we'd like. Let's leave it and come back if there's something else in the future. I think it's far better to do that than to sort of commit to working around something but you're not in totally what's the best one to look for, you're totally, you know, on board with, and then find yourself doing that alongside something else and something else. And basically you're not doing anything particularly well, you're doing lots of things not very well. So it's really better to sort of, if you can, specialise, focus and be very selective. Um, then once you've identified a partner, I thought I'd have a quick chat about working together. Now, again, a lot of the conversation um, is focused on big grant opportunities, and I'll talk about some of those later on. I would always say the best thing to do is just do something, anything to get going, but something small. So something that's short term, outcome orientated, um, that you can deliver fairly quickly is a great way of testing how strong the relationship is, how easy it is to keep working together and the degree of commitment you're going to get from a partner organization. So if you could do something that almost doesn't cost anything and they're still willing to work with you, that's probably a good sign that they're committed to the actual areas of interest you're, you're talking about. So it might be you do something as simple as putting on a series of, you know, short lectures or training programs, an online symposium, an online conference, something that is relatively light touch, but something like that really gives you a feel for how well the relationship's going to work going forward. And if you can do something small, you can do something big. You just need to apply the same values, the same approaches, and just expand them and increase them or scale them up. I'm going to talk in a couple of slides about some of the kind of useful tools and approaches that help you develop projects well and partnerships well. But the one I will keep coming back to is about being smart. And I'll go through this and give an example a bit later on. But I think it's always important to have real clear, understandable targets for what you're doing. And smart is a good way of doing this. So 
specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. I'll give an example in the next couple of slides. But having those kind of goals built into whatever you do, whether it's short term, small, or long term and large, really helps you make clear what you're going to do, what you're not going to do, and how you're going to measure it. And that's a good way then of measuring success, both in terms of what you deliver and the relationship. And that kind of applies to the next point as well, as well about agreeing terms of reference. So when you set up any kind of partnership, again, the what's the term that gets used quite a lot? Mission drift or mission creep comes into it quite quickly, where you have an initial plan and then you start doing more things and more things. And again, that dilutes the quality of the things you're doing. So in terms of reference, which says, we're going to do this, we're going to focus on that. It won't be this for now. We can come back to that later, but we're just going to focus on this thing. Really makes it clear what your kind of parameters are of any kind of partnership. Um, and again, uh, something that really helps that is communication. So what I, I've put there about agreeing schedules and communication is important. So when you set up a new partnership or a new project, I always say like meet as often as possible without it becoming you know a strain. So you know if you've got a new project going on, even if it's just a ten minute meeting once a week or a couple of times a week, it's a good idea. As things develop, you might have longer meetings but further apart. But what I'd always say is stick to any meeting schedule you have because even if you feel like okay, well we haven't really done much project work because it's been a, a break or we've been doing other things. Keeping the communication, particularly with international partners, it's critical because, you know, you're not going to be in their line of sight physically a lot of the time. It's easy for things to get deprioritized. So even if the meeting is just to say, oh, have we done any more on this? No, not now. We're sort of out of the, the timetable for it. How are you? Keeping that personal relationship going and building those um, networks and, and and connections are critical to making the partnership work and like i say it's, it's good to talk even for two or three minutes just so you don't forget about each other and the other thing is once you start cancelling meetings it becomes quite easy to do it more often and then when you do need them it's hard to reschedule them back in and then the final thing i'd say is like appreciating that working cultures are different everywhere and so you know i I'm always fascinated and, and amazed and in awe of the sort of work ethic of a lot of the partner countries we work with from the UK and Wales, you know, how willing people are to take a call at unreasonable times of the night, how you'll get email responses that seem to be coming from what might be two in the morning their side, um, that kind of thing. In other, you know, in, in some places or, or other cultures, maybe email isn't the best way to start a conversation, or it might be the best way to start a conversation, but if you actually want to have something done quickly, use WhatsApp. You know, be aware that culture doesn't just apply at national level, it applies at institutional level, it applies at personal level. So how one person likes to work might be different to another. I work in an office of about 30 people across all our departments. We all work differently. We all, some of us like working from home. Some of us like to set aside time in a day just for emails and then others happy to do that in between other tasks. So these are the kind of things that if you understand the working culture of the people you're working with, It'll be much easier to understand what the levers are to motivate them to do things and also what the triggers are for them to be demotivated as well so really try and get a feel for what the working culture is and then again you know that comes with more broad concepts of culture about knowing when national holidays are and you know how long those holidays are and whether during that time it is you know um, an inconvenience to ask someone a question or like an affront or whether it's fine these are all things that come through you know developing the relationship but us and like i say an appreciation of culture and working culture is really important and then i feel like a lot of this might have been covered already so i'll skip through it a little bit but i'll just reiterate some of the points that first Anne made on the last session um yeah <laughs> first one is coming from my failed experiences of the past and people failing to make applications to us in time i think just have a deadline in mind if there's a funding deadline of um i don't know the 30th of june agree as a group that if you're putting in a joint application you'll hand the, the application in by the 15th and the reason for that is something will go wrong i don't know what it is it might be something different in every circumstances it might be that you get all the way to the end and then you need um you know the the the, the dean of the school to actually sign the application and they're not in the country or whatever it might be that um there's an additional piece of information you need just to complete the final part of the application and the person you need to do it isn't available. So always plan to get applications as early, never ever leave it to the last minute because something will hold it up no matter what. Um, I think this is very well addressed through the previous session, but just to reiterate, um, 
it's important that you understand what the funding partner is asking for and what their priorities are. Now, you might be very easy, it might be very easy for you to address those priorities through the project you want to do, whether it's in research or capacity building or teaching and learning, but make sure you're speaking in their language when you fill in the application form. Um, you know, don't, it would be foolish to miss out on an opportunity just because you haven't fully understood what the, what the kind of words, what the kind of priorities that they want to see in the application are. So just make sure you really understand the terms of reference and go from there. This was very well, um, very well covered in the last session, but I, I kind of want to make the point again. Uh, don't have intentions, make commitments. Don't say we would like to, it is our hope that, um, you know, at the end of this project, we believe that's nothing. Everyone has hopes. <laughs> that sounds quite bleak, but um, what I mean is that what you want is your statements in your application to be precise and committed. So it's not we hope that, it is we will prove that, or it's not we intend to, it's that we will deliver this. And again, that ties into the next point about using direct and concise language. Don't use, you know, 500 words when 200 would do. Um, avoid jargon, particularly internal jargon from your institution. And by all means, match the kind of terms and commonalities of language that are coming through from the funder. So if they specifically use the term in their required kind of, you know, priorities for funding call, make sure those are in there. But also make sure that the application is readable because uh, I made a brilliant point, which is, Assessors are not always experts. Absolutely true. I know this because I'm often an assessor and I'm definitely not an expert. So I'm frequently, you know, I've frequently had the opportunity to review applications for funding around a topic I do not understand. And that happens in, you know, several places. What I need to be able to do as an assessor is understand from the quality of the writing and the quality of the way an idea is presented, what the project or what the application is going to deliver. So yeah, make sure you're you're saying things clearly and in, in an understandable way and using the right terminology, the appropriate terminology. And Lynn made a brilliant point, which I'm going to include and build on here. Make friends with your finance department. Um, because when you're making an application, ultimately they will have some say in, first of all, the sign off of the application, because any funding that comes to your institution will have to be pre-approved by a finance department more often than not. They will definitely help you with costings. When you're talking about match funding, your staff costs will not be your salary divided by days. It will be some very complex calculation around the cost of your salary versus the cost of uh, allied with the cost of your desk space for the cost of the electricity for your computer plus you know your pension and tax contributions. So your your finance department, or if you're doing sort of match funding based on staff costs, tell you what those are. So find the right person, whether that's at the whole institutional level or a faculty level, make friends with them. Because even after the application is in and approved, when you need to release funding for travel or for whatever it is, you will still need to go through them. So yeah, I, they're, they're always a good person. Um, and then finally, the last point around this about making funding applications is um, don't hope plan. So don't you know have an idea and hope it can be delivered. Make sure you're utilizing resources and tools and you know perspectives that will help you do that. So I'm going to talk through some of those fairly quick. How much time do I have? Sorry, we run out of time. I think you can still uh, maybe cover um, the remainder of the uh, talk in maybe five, ten minutes. Uh, Perfect. Okay. Five minutes. I, won't, I won't take long. I'll leave some time for questions. So thanks. Um, I've, I've got a background which um, I bore people with on a regular basis in project management, but I do think it really helps when you are applying any kind of process or any kind of thinking around delivering a project with partners, particularly internationally, where it's quite difficult to have. Um, you know, regular communication. It's much better to have, like I say, tools and concepts to work around so you understand clearly what you're trying to do. So I talked about SMART goals earlier being specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. And I've given an example here, of like the difference between a goal that is and isn't SMART. So I want to get fitter is not a SMART goal because it has no real depth to it other than a kind of vague aspiration. On the other hand, by the end of July 2024, I will be able to run 10 kilometers in under an hour is very specific. It's also measurable. It's, you know, I'm saying achievable, but you can change the time limit however you see appropriate or the distance, but there is an achievable element to it. 
it's relevant to what I want to do because it will make me fitter and there's a time bound element to me. So I've given myself a deadline to complete it. And any kind of project you're doing should be built around these kind of goals. Because if you say we want to improve um, learner outcomes from pupils with from a widening participation background, that's brilliant, but it has no measurable quality within it. If you say we want to see you know, an increase in uh, test scoring for 60% of pupils who come under this demographic, then you're giving, and we have to see this by a certain point, that is smart. Um, a critical path we talked about a little bit in the previous session as well, uh, Professor Un referred to them as um, work packages. What are the things you need to do throughout the course of a project? A critical path is basically just a mapping exercise. We put all those work packages or pieces of um, delivery for one of a better term together, and you order them in such a way that you know what needs to follow what, what is dependent on the other, what you know what can't happen until the other one is finished what things can be run concurrently that's really helpful in sort of planning a project out um a SWOT analysis again apologies if some of this is is kind of things you already know or covered already but it's a very good exercise at the beginning of a project to just think about how viable a project is so it's an analysis and basically do a four box grid you write the strengths of your idea or the strengths of your proposal in one area the weaknesses in another so you know what what, what won't work about it what potentially couldn't work where the opportunities are there might be what are the funding opportunities to support it where are the opportunities to develop this idea for, further and where are the threats you know what are the kind of either internal or external factors that will make your project difficult to deliver and once you've done all that as long as you can balance strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats in a way that you feel still makes the project viable then go ahead there's no there's no problem with having weaknesses and threats there's always weaknesses and threats it's just needing to acknowledge them and plan around them and then the last one i'll talk about in, in a sort of a little amount of detail is reiki charts and again these are quite useful for once you've agreed to work together on a project or once you're putting together an application for funding a way of deciding who the project's going to be and under each of these uh, work packages or tasks what role people are going to have with, within them so there should be someone for each task who is responsible which is the person who'll do the thing um you know whether that's if it's taking minutes that's the person that takes minutes the person who's accountable is the person who checks the thing and if the thing is wrong is ultimately to blame the person who's consulted might be several people but it's also you know who do you go to to verify the information is correct and then the people who are informed is just who do you tell once you've done the thing who do you need to inform they might not have a role other than going that's nice to know but it's always no it's always got to be an, a person or a group of people that are informed about the task as well so those are four useful tools and, and you can quite easily find examples and youtube videos how to use those, any of those online another few that i think are always worth looking at is if you're looking at um something which is quite conceptual particularly around concepts around changing perspectives or a culture shift a theory of change model is really useful whereby you have a change statement at the end which is quite vague but that's supported by um actions and deliverables that will drive that change and um, again i won't go through all this now uh, problem tree analysis <clears throat> excuse me is is always worth looking at because that's a good way of identifying where the kind of issues are in a in a system or within a program or, or anything really if you understand what the issues are and you can run a problem tree analysis through it which i can share some information on after today you can then turn the problem around and understand what the issues are and then a, sort of develop appropriate actions to address those issues uh, a risk register, uh, probably a lot of you will be familiar with, but that's a good way of grading risk and just understanding anything you're doing, what the kind of problems that you might face are around it. But also then being happy to take those risks on, provided they're low and likely to have little impact, or having mitigation in, plan in place so you can work around them. And finally, maybe one of the first things to do is a cost benefit analysis, which is a very simple, like, yes, no kind of um, think pr thought process about delivering any kind of project. You know, what are the costs whether that's time funding risk and what are the benefits and if they don't measure out if there's not you know if the benefits don't outweigh the cost then it's not worth doing basically um that's kind of it as far as the presentation goes i just thought it'd be useful before i hand over to questions to just mention one other thing um as we've been talking about funding um first of all to say that for those of you based in in welsh institutions we do have a fund for partnerships, for small scale partnerships, which opens uh, probably in the next couple of months. Um, those of you that came 
um, met us in the uh, in the embassy in November time. We we launched one funding call there, and that's now closed and been um, funding's been allocated. But we'll have another call in a couple of months time. I'm not sure exactly when yet, but again, that'll be open to Welsh universities to do partnership applications with um, Vietnamese partners. That might be something you you'd be interested in picking up on. I'd also say as well, a really great resource for all of you, if you don't know about it, is Universities UK's, University UK rather's uh, Global Research and Innovation Network. Now, if you go onto the Global Research and Innovation Network page, at the bottom of that, um, there's the, um, it's essentially a grant finding tool, but what it is essentially a database of all open funding calls in research and innovation. Um, and you can filter by eligible country, subject area. It's really extensive. It's really, you know, it's really vital. Like, what's what I look for? Vital. It's updated all the time. So, if you are in a position where you've got your partners in mind, you've got a project in mind, and you need to find a, a resource to support it, I would say have a look at that. But conscious of the time, I'm going to stop talking and, and just see if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, uh, for sharing with us the um, useful information, in particular on how to make funding applications involving international partners um, so i think the information is much appreciated uh, can i just quickly ask you so then for those colleagues in vietnam that wish to apply for funding from global wales then could you suggest the um the route i mean do they have to involve other colleagues um based in wales so if you have colleagues who are currently based in vietnamese institutions they would the funding applications would need to come through the Welsh University, so they'd need to have a Welsh partner to work with. Um, if there are people who are in that position that don't have a Welsh partner university, they're, they're very welcome to contact me. The, the, it would be very useful to have a kind of summary of their of their research interests or their partnership interests. And what I can do is share that through our network of universities, the eight universities I, I mentioned earlier on, and see which of them you know might be interested in picking that up. You know, we've got quite in-depth connections now so if it's if it's in a certain area i can probably find the right person to connect them with with an university okay that sounds great i hope that we'll see a lot of applications uh, from from mm -hmm. vietnam uh, to to global wales in the future yeah are there any questions for bill Okay. Um, if not, then once again, thank you so much, Bill, for, for your time and for sharing with us very useful information. I'm sure that if people are interested, then they will send you questions directly. Yeah, I, I, am, I do have to, I'm afraid, leave for another call now. So, oh, sure, um, sure. That, no, I, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have um, spoke with everyone today. And, and as you say, I'm, I'm very happy to take um, emails. I, you know, I'll pass the slides on for the circulation and you have my contact details there. But yeah, very happy to follow up on anything we've discussed today and, and thank you again everyone come on for your uh, for your attention and I hope to catch Brilliant. You thank you very soon. much and, and thanks for trying the Vietnamese at the beginning um yeah. it sounded right yeah, yeah thank yeah. you thank thanks you Bill. Duolingo <laughs> thank you Bill and we surely will have a meeting with you um soon uh, yeah. when we have the uh, study visits um shaping up mm. the yeah, plans so we will yeah. we'll keep you updated thank you so much thank yeah. you all right I'll see you very soon thank you thank all you right. Okay, so we are now coming to the next part of our workshop, uh, the final part, I believe. Um, this is the section on how to develop your narrative CVs, and the session will be led by um, Chike Wang and um, Ving Duan, who is uh, a senior lecturer, a reader at Warwick. Thank you. Thank you, Viet Ang. And... Um... All the previous speakers have emphasized the importance of um, capability of researcher and track record and potential and research vision of researchers. So Dr. Ving and I um, aim in this um, session to give you some uh, practical experience from our own experience, uh, writing a very crucial part in a grant application. Uh, in order to introduce yourself um, to the funder, that is the CV. But there are different way of writing CV uh, to support your grant application. The CV could be an individual CV or team CV. So today we focus on a specific format of CV that is narrative CV um, of team and individual. So I will go first and then um, Dr. Ving will um, then chip in as we go along. 
So what is the narrative CV and which funder required? Um, this is a new, a new format of CV that increasing uh, that a, an increasing number of funder has now uh, required or has introduced um, this format. Uh, why these CV were introduced? Because um, across a number of uh, funder in the UK and in Europe, they believe that this new format allow more achievement to be visible. Um, and also encourage the use of much wider criteria for assessment beyond the normal metric of citation and, and fact, um, impact factor index of um, journal. And also uh, avoid lengthy CV that everyone uh, can write as long as their career lasts or as long as they wish. So there is a limit of um, spade, uh, how long uh, the CV should be. And um, one very special uh, section is that the additional information section, which normalize the career break and also the different uh, trajectory in your professional development. Um, there is there should be a normal a normal um, practice to write that you have paternity leave, you have maternity leave, or you change from one uh, career outside academia into academia. Um, so that information, it actually tell who you are and why you have the ability that other may not have, or you have other duty, but you still achieve within the period of time that you present to the funder. And it's also to provide the context so that um, many reviewers who are not specialists in your field, like uh, Professor Ahn earlier mentioned, they would be able to understand the context of your achievement. So which funder um, uh, using this? Uh, for my own experience last year, applying for a grant uh, of the um, European Research Council, they specifically asked for this format and they have their trick template to follow. Um, the Luxembourg um, National Council Research Council also applied one of the very active supporter of this format and the number of UK research council now asking for it. Um, I will provide you with the with the name later, but now we go to the next thing. Here you can see that at a researcher at any stage uh, of their professional life, um, there was some achievement that visible, which is the top of the iceberg, but many other things are invisible. And this format of CV aim to um, make your uh, invisible skill more visible or experience. For example, um, there is a space for you to write about your public engagement, a uh, space about how you develop other, how you work with a local community, for example. Um, so basically, um, what does it look like, uh, a narrative CV, whether it's a team CV or, or individual CV, um, typically in the UK, most funders ask for two to four um, A4 pages. Um, so you need to look at the requirement. And most often uh, for an in individual um, CV for a certain grant size of the grant, um, you might aim for two and maximum four uh, pages only. And um, the format of this CV consists of four modules um, and it's very specific um, area that you need to emphasize. The first one is how you generate knowledge. Um, knowledge here could be um, could be your method, could be your um, uh, could could be uh, a specific uh, set of data. It could also be um, a publication or policy paper as well. So the, the, the definition of knowledge is actually broader than just academic paper in journal. And the second is the developments uh, of other colleagues, how you contribute to build your team. And the third session is uh, the third module is about contrib your contribution to the wider research uh, community. For example, you are, um, uh, a reviewers or advisory board uh, members of a certain um, committee um, in your field. Um, so the question here is um, the funder would like to see how you have learned and what uh, ability and what capability you have developed in all of these areas and not just the name of your achievement. 
Um, so, for example, when you have grant, what kind of um, thing that you have learned? Um, the story, like Cern mentioned before, this is actually a story about your own academic journey and um, also the even the failure, what you have learned from uh, your own failures could be mentioned here selectively. But of course, um, you also need to show that how you contribute to the wider um, you know, society, for example, how you engage with public, how you are present yourself as um, a public intellectual figure. So, and, and one last thing is the additional information, uh, where it, of course it's optional, but it's an invitation for you to write more about yourself if you have done any uh, voluntary work, any, uh, any work that um, may be outside academia, but it actually formed you who you are and formed you um, and give you the quality that maybe other researchers uh, do not have. So, um, here are the some that everybody earlier said about evidencing your track record. You need to have evidence, just, just not name them, but you need to uh, give evidence. So I, on the right-hand side, the metric of many things um, that can be, in search in, in, can be inserted in your CV, but to structure it normally, um, I just offer some tip and then you will discuss further in, in, in the breakout group. And I can see that we have um, about 40 people in the call, then we're going to divide it into five group and I already contacted each of the facilitator. I hope you can stay on, but um, for the audience. So in order to craft um, a narrative CV here, I'm talking about individual CV. So first of all, like a handshake, um, we need to start with two or three opening sentences, the key um, skill and ability that relevant to the call, and then you build the pictures of your career. And then, of course, you have to be very selective. Some funders say that you need only five publications or five points in one section, and you need to be careful um, to, to choose carefully which ones you put in and what kind of narrative you give to that particular achievement. And earlier, the, the uh, speaker also mentioned about uh, you, the word we will do. Uh, so in, in this CV, you in the same line, you need to use active word. Uh, I have led a team or I have managed it. I have informed or transformed or developed something. So you uh, active work um, and, this, and you the first person, I would do this or we do this and not passive um, in general. So if you are being asked about the whole team track record, very often the academic forgot that we have technician, project manager. Um, so if you are uh, writing a team uh, CV, do include administrator, project um, manager into your, your CV. 